Uh, good morning and welcome to our Institute for Government live event on how to run a successful public inquiry into COVID-19. It's a real pleasure to have you with us today and I'm delighted to introduce our fantastic panel. Um, joining me today we have Sir Bernard Jenkin, uh, MP and Chair of the Commons Liaison Committee, who also chaired the Public Administration and Constitutional Affairs Committee from 2010 to 2019. Uh, Sally Warren is Director of Policy at the King's Fund and was previously a senior civil servant in the Department of Health and Social Care, Public Health England, DEFRA and the Cabinet Office. Leila Moran is MP and uh, Liberal Democrat spokesman for uh, Foreign Affairs and currently chair of the All Party Parliamentary Group on Coronavirus. And Sir Lawrence Friedman is Emeritus Professor of War Studies at King's College London and was a panellist on the Chilcot Inquiry, which examined Britain's role in the 2003 Iraq War. Uh, it's a real pleasure to have you all here today and I'm really looking forward to hearing your thoughts. So on the 12th of May, the Prime Minister announced that there will be a statutory inquiry into the UK's response to the coronavirus, and this will start in the spring of 2022. He promised that the inquiry would be able to put the state's actions under the microscope and that uh, no one would see uh, any fear or favour, uh, that everyone would be heard from and that the inquiry would have the full power to investigate whatever it needed as possible. This, uh, call, this announcement of this inquiry followed calls from members of all parties, uh, from organisations such as the Institute for Government and the King's Fund, and from the public, in particular groups of people who have lost family and friends to COVID and suffered other harms. But how will this inquiry be run? What should it cover? And how could it ensure that lessons will be learned and accountability delivered? Uh, to answer this, I'm, I'm going to turn to our panel. And um, if I could start first with, with Lawrence and Sally. Uh, Lawrence, you recently laid out an argument in Prospect magazine that the traditional model of the inquiry might not be able to manage the, the scope and scale of the issues at hand here. Uh, as you note in your piece, the, the challenge for this inquiry is not so much about gathering evidence, but making sense of it. Uh, you said we need a framework to look at this and, and conveniently we have Sally with us because uh, the King's Fund has actually published an audit framework for government decision making during the crisis. So if I could ask Lawrence first, how do you think this inquiry should be constituted uh, so it can uh, run successfully? Well, I think you've got a trade-off with an inquiry. Uh, you want it to be thorough, you want it to be forensic, you want people to be accountable. Um, at the same time, you don't want it to take forever. And as somebody who's part of an inquiry that lasted seven years, I feel quite strongly about that. Um, partly that's a question of scope. Um, but it's also a question of organisation. I think we've really got to rethink our models of what an inquiry looks like. Um, we don't have to have um, some old judge sitting for, for, for years going through the evidence bit by bit until the final report is eventually delivered. You can be releasing material as you go along. You can be commissioning research. I think you would want quite a large panel with different sorts of expertise, each leading a different work stream. Um, and you've got to recognise an enormous amount of work has already been done. Parliament has had many hearings in which the main players have already spoken. Um, the, 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 there's a vast industry of, of academic research now um, that has looked at the origins of the virus and how it's um, uh, how it's impacted on different countries. After all, this has got to be comparative. There's no point, you know, a lot of the criticisms that are made of our government are made uh, by reference to what others have done or indeed with the vaccines, how maybe we've done things better. Um, well, you've got to do proper comparative work then. So I just don't think one person or even a small group of people can manage this sitting by themselves over a number of years. You've got to open it up. There's not the sorts of issues of classification that Chilcot have to deal with. Uh, the, the, the degrees of confidentiality are not, are not uh, overbearing. Um, and so you, you can you can release material as you, as, as you go. And, you know, as far as lessons learned, I mean, you know, obviously some lessons hopefully already have been learned. It's not something that, that, that should wait until an inquiry eventually speaks. You, you, you want that to be happening all the time. So I, I see some much more dynamic on uh, broad based uh, process with leadership. It needs leadership and it needs structure, um, but it doesn't have to be private. Um, and also just for the final point, I don't think it has to be dominated by hearings. Um, I think for many people, 
that's what accountability looks like. And probably with Chilcot, that was the case. And you will want hearings, um, but they're not the best way of getting the evidence often that you need. Uh, so, uh, and, I, and I think again, if you know, looking through the documents, commissioning proper research is a way of, of speeding things up uh, and actually getting a good knowledge base uh, well before you start to in interrogate the senior policymakers. Thanks, Lawrence. That was uh, really interesting. So, Sally, if, if if I could just come to you to follow up on that, you've um, you've obviously published this audit framework for government decision making. So, what do you think, uh, Lawrence spoke there of of the evidence, and you know maybe not actually needing to do all of this through hearings, but what approach do you think the inquiry should take to make sense of what evidence it has and, and how it should collect collate that? Yeah. Uh Thanks, Marcus, and thanks, Lawrence. It's great to join you all this afternoon. Um, so uh, clearly, when I, when I think about an inquiry, it, it could be a huge scale. Uh, and part of the point, as Lawrence has talked about, is making it an achievable uh, scale of inquiry. Um, and for me, that's about understanding how the, the, the vast response to COVID, how you can group those together and understand how they're connected. So the King's Fund has published a framework which looks at five broad areas of the response. Um, and each of those should be a core part of any approach from the inquiry. One is around the intrinsic risk that we faced as a, a as a country, which will be different based on different demographic profiles and different kind of societal norms. So kind of what was our intrinsic risk? The second area is around our public health response. So that's things like uh, our approach to lockdown, our approach to test, trace and isolate, uh, how effective were we at making decisions quickly and how uh, well did we implement those decisions? Um, the third uh, area is around how the health service responded to COVID. And there's a number of factors within that, which will be around, for example, surge capacity. How did they increase critical care capacity at the start of the pandemic? What did they do around infection prevention and control, both for the staff working in the NHS, but also for patients? Um, how did they rapidly shift delivery models to mean that there was less face to face and therefore less risk? Um, and then also, how did they innovate around research and development, working with the life sciences sector and uh, the regulators around clinical trials and really fast tracking uh, new treatments uh, for this area? So there's a health service response. Similarly, we look from an adult social care perspective and see again here there'll be a, a set of issues around um, how did how was the risk to the population that is supported by adult social care understood? How were they supported? Uh, how was the risk of infection to them reduced, but also how were they allowed to live their lives? How was staff supported in that sector? And I think the one bit that's really important to recognise is that the scale of challenge that the health and social care sector faced was largely determined by the amount of community transmission that was happening. So actually, the public health response determines really the, the scale of challenge that the NHS and our adult social care sectors have faced. So it's why you, you need to kind of see all of these things in, in the whole and not just look at a health service response and try and compare that to the health service response in New Zealand or America. Finally, uh, a key area for us is around um, the economy and wider society. So what measures were taken around supporting business, uh, supporting the education sector and pupils needing to learn, wider civic society and the really important role of the voluntary sector and a whole host of sectors that support our well-being uh, as a society, particularly as we, as we were going through long lockdowns. So we look at all of those five areas as quite interdependent. And when you're looking at each of them, for me, some of the key dilemmas is how was evidence used? How were decisions made using that evidence? Really importantly, how well were those decisions then communicated and implemented? And you can look at those questions at a UK level, at a Four Nations level, and also then looking at kind of local government as well. The one final thing I say on how to use evidence is hindsight is a wonderful thing when it comes to pandemics. We know considerably more now about COVID-19 than we did 15, 16 months ago. So one of the really important things to say as well is not was that decision right? But did that decision seem right based on the information that was available at the time? And that's a very hard thing to uh, grapple with. So it's where for me it is really important, uh, as Lawrence talked about, the breadth of different types of evidence. So yes, some panel hearings, but also what's the paperwork from government? What's the wider research community? What was the international community uh, saying at those times? And all of that coming together can really help inform an inquiry. Thanks, Marcus. Thanks, Sally. That was really interesting. Uh, Bernard, if I could come to you now, um, you wrote a compelling and quite prescient piece for us in June last year, outlining what you saw then as the long-term consequences for Whitehall after the coronavirus. And uh, 
in this piece, you raised the likelihood of an inquiry and, and posed sort of questions for officials, ministers and political appointees uh, and the culture that surrounds them. Now, nearly a year later, with an inquiry to happen, we're thinking about what it should cover and how it can deliver accountability. And I'd really love to hear from you as someone who spent probably more time grilling ministers and officials than almost anyone else. Do you see the inquiry as a sufficient institution to deliver accountability? How do you think it needs to approach the question of how decisions were made in Whitehall throughout the crisis? And sort of how can it be run? I mean, we, we saw the seven hour Dominic Athon, you know, a week or so ago. How, how can it actually sort of, you know, be serious? Not so that it wasn't serious, but how, how can it sort of gri grapple with these really difficult questions, you know, with some of the people who were right at the heart of it? in a way that sort of you know reflects the seriousness of it and, and really actually delivers learning that the people want to hear. Um, thank you very much indeed, um, Chair. There's uh, a very pithy number of questions and it is about learning um, because we should actually ask ourselves at the outset, what is this inquiry actually for? Um, and it will be for many things and for many different people, but we must, must decide what the, the, the things are the most urgent. And yes, the inquiry needs to establish exactly what happened and what decisions were made or not made and who was making them and why. But all this is only a means to an end. The overriding purpose of such an inquiry is that it should be part of a process that will restore justified public confidence in our system. And uh, uh, I, I would suggest that that's had a bit of a blow under this present crisis. And therefore, I think the most urgent task is therefore to answer the question, what lessons need to be learned now to be better prepared for the next pandemic, which could be imminent? Um, and uh, what new permanent machinery of government and capability does there need to be to address these failings so that early indications of a pandemic threat leads to timely and effective action next time? And you, I just add, uh, what parliamentary committee should have responsibility for overseeing this? Because Parliament is already conducting many public inquiries, one of which you've referred to. Uh, but actually, Parliament's attention to a potential pandemic threat was pretty minimal until uh, this happened. Uh, so we need to address that too. I just um, uh, it's so good to have Laurie Friedman here with his vast experience. Um, following his uh, the Chilcot inquiry, we produced a report called Lessons Still to be Learned from the Chilcot inquiry. And if I just may summarise very briefly what that said, because uh, the report was pretty well ignored just in advance of the 2017 election. Um, so the lessons are still to be learned. We recommended that, and this reflects, reflects the role of Parliament and the accountability of the inquiry to Parliament. There should be a full debate and a vote in Parliament uh, on a substantive promotion setting out the precise terms of reference, an estimated time frame, and a proposed budget for the inquiry. And before that debate, that the Parliament should establish an ad hoc select committee to take evidence on the proposed remit and to present formal conclusions and recommendations to the House. So when the House votes, it's actually taking an informed and uh, researched view. The select committee should also recommend whether the inquiry, should, what kind of inquiry it should be. This one's predetermined to be a statutory inquiry, and I'll come to that, it should be. And it should conduct a pre-appointment hearing on the post inquiry chair, then the remit and the chair of the inquiry should be put before Parliament for final approval. And on this question of accountability, um, is the inquiry a sufficient institution to deliver accountability? Can accountability, accountability be delivered? Is it um, a, 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 a concept that has that quality to it? I doubt it. The public expect ministers and to an extent public officials, civil servants and others to be held accountable. And I'm pleased to see that the IFG report says it's not for inquiries to place blame um, and they should not try to perfect hindsight as was referred to earlier. But the public, I mean, public expects willful wrongdoing to be dealt with. Um, that's backward accountability, but uh, not an inquiry just to apportion blame, least of all for party political reasons. Uh, that would undermine further public confidence. We also, what we want is an honest, open truth about what happened and what needs to be done. Um, which will not happen if witnesses are turning up and people are submitting evidence in order to try and avoid blame. Um, so the, um, uh, there was a, there's quite a lot of blame coming into the select committees at the moment, and, and I'm not I'm not sure. I think that's one of the reasons to have a, a less political inquiry. 
So the purpose of an inquiry like this is to establish the truth so that we can hold those in power accountable for what they will do to put things right for the future, forward accountability. And as I said, it should be a statutory under a statutory uh, inquiry because you want witnesses under oath, you want their evidence to be legally privileged so they can say what they like without fear of being sued. Um, they can tell the truth without fear or favour. Um, and a judge usually provides at a judicial inquiry because there are rules of evidence and also the impartiality of a judge tends to add authority to the findings because we do want them implemented. Thank you. Thank you, Bernard. That was uh, really interesting. And yeah, we absolutely agree with that point about sort of, you know, needing to learn lessons and the, the role of Parliament sort of, you know, over the long term, seeing that sort of change happens. Leila, if I could come to you, I think um, actually Bernard has teed up my question quite well there. So as chair of the coronavirus APPG, you've been across the breadth of issues that this uh, crisis has produced. Um, one of the things as we've reflected here is I think that the uh, the only way this inquiry can run effectively is having a clearly defined and bounded scope. But inevitably there will be questions that people care about that fall outside of this. So I, I have a sort of a two part question for you. Firstly, whether an inquiry that focuses on how decisions were made within Whitehall would be sufficient. And secondly, sort of following up on what Bernard just raised there about, you know, the role of Parliament, um, both what it could have been with with Chilcot and what it hopefully should be with this inquiry. How do you see the role of Parliament shaping both the terms of reference and sort of, you know, overseeing the inquiry as it is uh, in progress? Thank you very much. Well, first of all, thank you for holding this event um, and the all party groups looking at it uh, ourselves in a week's time. Uh, and it's come off the back of, you know, months and months of people suggesting that this should be happening. But I think the Dominic Cummings debacle um, has just highlighted that actually this needs to be done in a way that is, you know, not looking at, well, who is the messenger and who's saying what and feeling a bit tit for tat and, and a bit retaliatory. And it's just very unhelpful to the people who I think really should be front and centre of this inquiry, which are bluntly the bereaved families and all those people suffering from long COVID who are now you know, 400,000 people are estimated to have been suffering with this debilitating disease for over a year. Um, you know, these are the kinds of collateral damage that's have happened because of this pandemic. And first of all, I think what a very uh, important thing for us to just consider is, you know, are we all agreed about what actually happened? You know, are we all agreed about the final death toll? Are we all agreed about the numbers of people who have suffered from long COVID? What are the numbers? How robust are the numbers? Are we certain about uh, that starting point? Because actually, I think that's a really important place to start and ensure we get right, because unless you do that, then you risk undermining everything that happens after that. In terms of then what you look at, I mean, there are some very obvious things. And actually, I thank Sally for the work that um, King's Fund's done to sort of look at the broad areas. But I think we are even within those five areas going to have to perhaps uh, even even narrow those down. Uh, the all party group specifically didn't look at the economy. Um, and the reason for that was because if you start to include that response as well, it does become absolutely Goliathan. And I wonder if some of the answer to this is to have a couple of inquiries running in parallel that talk to each other, one of which specifically is looking at the public health response in which, you know, you look at, you know, borders for a really good example, very, very topical right now. Uh, something that we as a group were raising with Parliament, uh, with the government seven months ago, and it took them that long in order to start putting things into place. And I think that question that Bernard uh, raised about, you know, Whitehall and why were, if we could see this information coming through from other countries, if we could see that this was the thing that needed to happen, what was happening in Whitehall that was stopping it from happening at the time? And then, of course, there was what happened next in terms of further lockdowns and the 251 billion pounds we've already spent on propping up all of those businesses when there was potentially another way that this could have happened. And I think that that's all incredibly important, but we might want to consider separating those kinds of things out. In terms of the role of Parliament, um, I mean, I think Parliament has felt very much as the, the second class citizen in all of this, um, whenever we've had coronavirus debates, very, very important debates about the way that this should have been tackled, the 
the way that we've been consulted in this, we were told from the beginning that this was something that we were going to be involved in. And actually the reality of it was that we had hours to debate fundamental changes to freedoms and response uh, public health response that actually in hindsight wasn't the right way to go and had we had longer had we had better scrutiny the question then becomes well <laughs> would it have been different and I very much hope that in the way that this is set up it does have the full support of not just the government benches but all sides of the house um, and that's why I think a select committee is probably the right place uh, to start to set this up because by nature they are cross-party and they try and achieve consensus and this should be a consensus driven uh, endeavour that does lead to real accountability for those families who have found themselves uh, worst affected by it. But one of the big bits of cynicism and I'll end here and I think it speaks to something Bernard said which I think is incredibly important. I think our democracy has taken a hit from the way that this has been dealt with and it started with the lack of transparency right at the beginning and it was echoed just last week when you know what did Matt Hancock say to who when about the protective ring around care homes and this really matters it really really matters and so when we're considering all of these questions it needs to be something that also has an element of teeth in it and so when we think about accountability for our elected officials I do think that waiting seven years well past the next date of the next election won't wash with the public. The way that we hold our elected officials to account is at the ballot box and the way that our citizens are going to be able to decide whether or not they want the same people running the country who got us through this pandemic is going to be in that next general election. So whatever we do, I think we can't wait until the end and I think some form of sort of interim report looking at sort of the big themes in it, starting to get to the bottom of actually who was to blame, who said what, um, certainly among the elected officials, is an important part of the democratic process that I think most people would just assume would be what this inquiry was for. And if it didn't deliver that, it would just be another blow to our systems, which are already creaking at the moment. Thank you, Leila. That was really interesting. And I think that nicely actually brings us back sort of to where we uh, began with sort of Lawrence's point about sort of, you know, the need for an inquiry that doesn't just, you know, vanish for seven years. Um, just to the audience, um, we're starting to get some really good questions in, but I'd encourage you to sort of as you know, please submit your questions uh, through the Q&A feature and we'll start going to that. I have sort of one more question just sort of broadly following up on what we've talked about here. Um, the next sort of big decision point, I guess, for the inquiry will be the appointment of the chair. Uh, Lawrence, you sort of mentioned at the top that, you know, sort of, I think, I don't know whether you, you said sort of a judge taking this off and sort of burying themselves for a while. And you said maybe actually there was a scope for a bigger panel. Could you sort of maybe just sort of um, talk a little bit about your experience about being on the Chilcot panel and how you see the role of a panel within an inquiry and, and how that could help deliver um, a more timely response and, and also I'd welcome the other panellists to sort of jump in after that with their thoughts on sort of who should sort of you know be leading and driving this inquiry forward from within. Yeah I, I mean just building on things that have been said so first it's clear there are a number of work streams I don't think there's two I think there's three or four or five I mean the, 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 the ones that Sally set out. Um, I wouldn't take Chilcot or any past inquiries as a model I really do think we have to think this through I would have a panel member in charge of each work stream um, so that they could get on with it uh, with researchers working for them. Um, th th these are big efforts, especially once you get into into the files, um, then you need people who actually understand how governments work. Uh, otherwise, you'll find that the, 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 the paper trail doesn't lead anywhere because you're not quite sure where to look. Um, a reliable account, which is one thing I think Chilcot did establish, is important. And one of the things I, I discovered through that is you can't do that in the way that a historian might do it by paraphrasing a few files. You've got to set it out uh, paragraph by paragraph. Otherwise, people think you, you're involved in a cover up. So um, you need you need a, a number of people all working and the, and the chair um, is sort of overseer of this coordinator pulling it together personally i'm not in favor of this being a judge-led inquiry i uh, it has to be statutory um 
we discussed this a lot in Chilcot. Uh, obviously, we, we were not judges, but, uh, but how judicial should it be? The advice we got is everybody lawyers up if you've got a judge. Every witness you've got will, will come with their own lawyer. Um, the bereaved families will have their lawyers who will want to write to cross-examine and it will go on and on. And then you've got to find a judge, uh, take the Savile inquiry in mind, uh, who's prepared to devote the rest of their career possibly to doing this because it'll just take time. I don't think you, you have to have uh, uh, the witnesses feeling um, that they respond. They have to respond to the questions. We didn't find that a problem, to be honest, in Chilcot. Um, but what somebody did tell me, and I'll end on this point, um, one of our witnesses said, actually with you, I'll, I'll say what I think. He was involved in another inquiry, which was a judge led and said, there I'm told I must say yes, no, or I can't remember. You don't want that. You want you want people to feel able to to unload themselves. And I think just worth remembering for many of the witnesses uh, who for whom this will be a very traumatic and memorable experience. This is an opportunity for them to get it up, to get it out what they went through, uh, how how they saw it at the time, um, maybe to get themselves vindicated, maybe to uh, apologize. But it'll be very important for the witnesses as well and, you, and if the extent you're going to have hearings you need a, a, a good opportunity for them to be able to uh, to speak their minds and, and say and say what's bothering them thank you that was really good uh, does anyone else want to jump in on the question of the chair and panel shall i i'll quickly jump Sally, in. yeah okay um so, so uh, uh, I think obviously what's really important is a balance of skills and experience across the panel. You're not going to find one person who has the, the totality of the knowledge here. So definitely uh, expertise about how government works uh, and in particular the different levels of government. So even if you're focusing even on decisions in Whitehall, those decisions in Whitehall affected Edinburgh, Cardiff, Belfast, etc. So government, um, science, uh, where it's both expertise in the science, but also expertise in how scientific evidence is used to inform decision making, which are uh, two slightly different things, uh, and uh, expertise in the law. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges we have is this has been such an all encompassing uh, period for the UK that actually there's very few people who are experts in the real science of pandemics who aren't involved in somewhere or another in the a response. So that's the key dilemma is, is how do you draw on that expertise when that expertise is already involved in the response and one of the ways to deal with that might be to look internationally to where it, in the international community is there that um, technical expertise that can sit either within the panel or alongside the panel to be able to kind of have that break between yes we've got a lot of expertise in this country some of what we've done on the g genome mapping etc has been outstanding but actually kind of do we have any of those people that aren't already involved in some way or another? That's a really tricky bit. Can I just quickly comment? Please, Bernard, yeah. Um, uh, uh, I thought um, many, many, many good points being made by all the panellists. Uh, just I, I will short circuits to the ones I disagree with because it's more interesting. Um, the, um, um, there will be lots of strands to pursue and I think the idea of having lots of concurrent inquiries under one umbrella is a is is a very obvious way to proceed. And incidentally, we ought to think in terms of, you know, why wasn't Whitehall learning all this anyway? And maybe this inquiry morphs into a new bit of the Cabinet Office that is permanently inquiring and learning and implementing lessons because it's the infinite learning organisation that we want to create in Whitehall that hasn't been there, which is why we got into this mess. Um, uh, but the question about, about the judicial inquiry or not, um, I do seem to remember that Chilcot inquiry went on and on, um, and it wasn't a judge that was responsible for that. That's why I think Parliament should be very clear. Here's your budget, here's your timetable, um, and these are the timelines we expect for these reports on these subjects, so that everybody, you know, the judge has to say, we haven't got time for all these lawyers. Sorry, we're going to have to short circuit all this. Let's get to the guts of it. Otherwise, it turns into a dripping rose for the lawyers. Quite right on that point. And finally, on the panel, um, I think you want plenty of insiders as well as outsiders on the panel. I mean, we should have a former cabinet secretary, maybe even a former prime minister uh, on, on, the, on the top panel, uh, a, a former chief scientific advisor, a, a former chief medical officer. Um, people who really understand the inside of Whitehall and the, 
I mean, one of the strands might be the the um, the way uh, science intersected with policy, because at one point science seemed to be the tyranny and the, the politicians were abdicating decisions to science as though the science was a single thing which everybody agreed about and would lead to a simple decision. Actually, there's, there was lots of science disputed, disagreeing, and in the end, the politicians had to learn to make judgments um, very much on non-scientific criteria as much as scientific criteria. So, and also I would just emphasize this thing about data, Leila is absolutely right. There, would sh there should be a whole strand on data. I mean, I, I'm quite perplexed actually how, um, I, I mean, U UKSA is the UK Statistics Authority, uh, Authority, is a much underfunded organization and probably didn't have much spare capacity, but there should be absolutely really big stuff looking at the data because the data was so important in this. And incidentally, one thing I disagreed with in the report, uh, the IFG report, um, I don't think the UK public inquiry, UK government public inquiry should confine itself just to UK government issues. It's a United Kingdom government for the whole of the United Kingdom. And data is one of the areas where there's a lot of confusion because Wales and Scotland have decided to collect data differently, collect different kinds of data, probably in order to make it less accountable. So that it's not easy to make comparisons between the different jurisdictions in the United Kingdom. That's a reduction in accountability. And I think the data strand should look at what data uh, needs to be uniformly collected. Those powers already exist. It's not a power grab. The National Statistical Office and UK Statistics Authority can uh, can determine how uh, regulates the other governments as well. And the, the inquiry ought to determine where those powers should be used much more forcefully than they have been in order that we get coherent UK data. Could I come in just very briefly and then I know we'll move on, but just to mention a couple of points that um, I think perhaps are worth emphasising. And I can't remember who mentioned it, but the fact is other countries are going to be looking at this at the same time. And it needs to, be, I think Laurie said, it needs to be comparative. I mean, by mm. nature, because it is a pandemic, um, the response across many countries and the fact that we are all interconnected, the unique susceptibility of the UK in many ways, but also the unique strength of the UK in being an island, you know, are a part of it. But we were taking a lot of our uh, our calls um, from evidence that was also being presented by bodies like the WHO. Uh, which countries were we listening to more or less? You know, they're very uh, clearly developed a sort of uh, Western liberal response versus uh, an Asian response that was uh, perhaps more practiced given uh, their experiences uh, with previous uh, previous epidemics of, of a similar type. Um, and so actually understanding how that was playing into the decision making process, I think, is really very important and shouldn't be forgotten. And ideally, there is some kind of way that this is being joined up across the world, because if you also get different versions of what happened in this pandemic, in different parts of the world, you need to understand why. And then just focusing in a bit more uh, parochially, quite literally, um, the response of local government was actually the way that many of these decisions were actually being implemented. And there are two things here. There is the decision being made, but then the way the decision actually ended up being implemented on the ground are two very different things. Um, and so understanding the interplay between those two, which also uh, uh, plays into that uh, devolved nations um, aspect. I mean, do the devolved nations themselves want their own inquiries to look at their own responses? Um, and I think given uh, the accountability mechanisms, how much of it was devolved, I think it's very important that actually that happens in of itself, in its own right. Um, and I would hope very much that, you know, uh, the Senate and Holyrood and uh, in Northern Ireland, they're thinking about doing this for themselves as well. I haven't heard very much uh, I don't think uh, about that. Um, and I'd be curious to see how the, all of them are going to interplay because of course one is going to feed into the other. Actually, thank you for all those points. And, and that tees me up straight into the sort of the audience question I was going to get to. I, I would, actually, I'll just sort of say, uh, John Vickers, I hope uh, in there, all the discussion about the chair has covered your question about whether an English judge would understand epidemiology and virology. I think the answer is to give them a good panel. But yes, uh, following up on those points from uh, Leila and Bernard, uh, we've had a couple of questions, one from Faith, 
uh, interested to hear panel's views on the relationship the inquiry would have with the devolved administrations and one from William Duncan. Should there be only one UK inquiry or does there need to be a distinctive but coordinated inquiries for each of the nations? Uh, Bernard, do you want to well, jump on this one? Well, I'm, I expect the government will seek to create one UK inquiry. Um, but whatever takes, uh, whatever form that takes, nothing precludes the devolved administrations from holding their own inquiries and indeed for their own inquiries to investigate what uh, was happening in the UK government. Uh, I think um, um, if it was a judicial inquiry held in Scotland, I think the, that um, ministers and officials would be obliged to attend. Um, I don't think they can escape jurisdiction by just running backwards across the border. So, uh, so I don't think the, um, I, I recognise the um, sensitivity of this um, and, and I hope that there would be one single inquiry which would uh, involve all the devolved administrations and have the confidence of them all. Um, but if they didn't want to play ball and wanted to do their own thing, they'd be entirely free to do so. And there's nothing anybody could do about that. Definitely. Uh, Lawrence or Sally, do you want to come in on the devolved question? Well, I, I mean, I agree with what Bernard just said. I, I, I you know, the, 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 the relevant people on stage came from all the uh, from all parts of the United Kingdom. Um, a lot of the, it's true. A lot of the information was gathered separately, but a lot of it was gathered together. I, I can't see how you could avoid a UK-wide inquiry, but the differences are very important, and, and they're important in the comparative element because you know maybe you know what Wales has gone shot, shooting off with the uh, with its vaccination program. What did they do better than others? So I think um, there's things we can learn from each other. And again, I keep on coming back to the idea of a much more flexible structure uh, in which you don't have to wait till it's all done mm. you could be moving on different strands at different speeds all at once and that could include uh having um the specific things looking at individually individual parts of the uh, of the uk uh I, I think the more the more that we think in terms of the traditional inquiry the longer and more frustrating mm. this will become uh and you know i uh, uh, and every time somebody goes on about how long Chilcot took, which is true, the problem was that we had to carry on because otherwise it would look like a cover up. And, and until you'd got the information out, people wouldn't trust it. And, uh, you know, having been managed many research projects and PhDs in my life, you can say you've only got 18 months or two years and it never works out like that because these things just turn out to be too complicated. But you can get over that by relying on interim reports, progress reports, studies coming out. I think if Bernard and I talk long enough on this, we can agree. Yeah, yeah I agree with that. Mm. Interim reports. Cool, and um, that's really interesting. Thank you very much. Um, Lalo, conscious that we are going to lose you at quarter two, um, and thank you for your time. Someone uh, had a sort of a question, which actually also I, I imagine others will have a view on. Um, about the governance, someone, uh, unfortunately they're anonymous, so I can't say who it was. Questions about the powers of the Coronavirus Act and whether this should be something. Should should uh, sort of the role of parliamentary scrutiny and the sort of, you know, the, the way that these powers were constituted be something that the inquiry should consider. And I, I realise that this is something that is of interest, I think, to members of all parties. Um, mm. So yeah, do you have any thoughts on that? Thank you. Um, I uh, And also apologies for, for having to leave in five minutes. I, I, I just want to say how useful this has been and how, I mean, as a complete novice to these things, when people then ask, you know, what is, I honestly, probably very naively, well, clearly very naively, thought that there was a manual for how these things happen. <laughs> and there very clearly isn't. Um, and this is going to have to be like so much in this pandemic, uh, something we're going to have to write for ourselves, um, but mindfully and consciously. So thank you uh, to the Institute for Government for starting this conversation, uh, which will no doubt continue to dominate. Uh, and I hope it does, because we need to have these, these conversations. Um, but to the point of parliamentary scrutiny, and I raised it in my opening remarks, I mean, I think it was incredibly important and the lack of it, I think, made the whole process poorer. Uh, the general lack of transparency, the way that MPs were, uh, you know, being told what, what it was that we needed to, to sort of do and say, 
but actually whenever there was dissent, whenever there was uh, people having different views, actually many felt frozen out completely from the process. And so the, the point around what well, High Science 2020 uh, frustrates a lot of MPs because a lot of us at the time were raising, for example, what was happening in care homes because we were seeing it on the ground Two ministers. That's not hindsight. That's an inability to actually take into account our, our job as parliamentarians, which is to represent our constituents at the time to solve the problems that we were seeing. Now, the question was, though, should this be part of the inquiry? I hesitate simply because I think what that was speaking to was a perhaps more fundamental problem with the way our parliament and our structures are working at the moment. And I rather suspect that actually it will come under scrutiny within the scope of the inquiry, but I'm not convinced it should be its own sort of work stream. I think it's going to be something that falls out and perhaps lands in the lap of, of perhaps another committee elsewhere. I think there is a more, uh, a deeper question that we need to ask which is at times of crisis, what is the role of Parliament? And it should be a very simple question, but I think what this process has shown is it one is one that doesn't have a, a defined answer to. And I think many parliamentarians would agree it's been a very dissatisfactory uh, way that Parliament was engaged with during this process and, and therefore needs changing. But I've no doubt Bernard has much more developed thoughts on such things than I. Um, so I'll leave it to the rest of the panel to continue without me. <laughs> Thank you, Leila. Um, it's been really great having you and uh, we really appreciate your thoughts and hope to keep up with you on this in the future. And uh, please stick around because the rest of our panel is still here and there's some questions coming in. Uh, Bernard, I don't know if you wanted to pick up on that or well, Sally. Um, um, I would just caution that um, uh, in a national emergency, you need the government to take responsibility and to be capable of taking action. Um, and um, a part, it's, uh, the, the job of Parliament is not to take over the role of government. The job of Parliament is to hold Parliament, hold government to account, and the government has to maintain the competence of Parliament. And in a crisis, the government takes extra power, so, uh, but it can only do so if it maintains the competence of Parliament. That's how our system works, and then we clear up afterwards. But I think the real, the real point here is the lack of transparency, and I think everyone's now saying if there'd be much more transparency earlier on. But but there was a lot of fear. There was a lot of fear that um, that uh, amongst ministers and officials, I think that they, once the crisis really broke, they didn't know what they were doing. Uh, they were very scared about letting information to the public domain and undermining public confidence about their lack of self-confidence and uncertainty. And I, you know, I think it is a very natural human reaction. The answer is maybe one of the lessons will be to learn that you know, where there is an enemy that can't read emails or or intercept uh, telegrams to go back to a World War national analogy, um, and you don't need to put everything in code, you, you don't need secrecy, there is actually great utility in transparency. And it's not something that Parliament should need to be demanding, it should be something the government wants for its own sake. Thank you very much. Sally, we've, we've had um, quite a few questions. Um, people, Derek Young, uh, was very interested in sort of what you were talking about, how it might outline. And uh, there's another interesting question here from someone called uh, Tariq York, um, talking about sort of just how you manage the different, uh, just thinking again about the scope and the strands of this inquiry. I think, you know, there seems to be a good consensus here that having an inquiry that is modularized in a way would, would allow it to work more efficiently under the leadership of perhaps sort of a, a big panel. One of the things that I've been really interested in, and, and it'd be great to sort of get more thoughts from you on this is, you know, you have these sort of five areas that you've identified, but they don't decompose perfectly. There are overlaps and sort of part of Tariq's questions, which I think is interesting and, and hopefully speaks to what others are interested in. How, how do you manage some of those overlaps, some of the fuzziness between the way decisions were made? Like, you know, you can't make a decision to close schools without thinking of what that means for like working parents and stuff like that. Um, so how would you see as that sort of teasing that out and making that workable in an inquiry setting? Yeah. Yeah. Um... Thanks. It's a really, really good question from Tarek. Um, and it's absolutely right. As much as we've created five broad buckets, there's blur at the edges of those kind of buckets of areas and there's definitely interdependence. Um, so I think what's really important if to make it manageable, if you are looking at five 
five, six, seven individual work streams, you do then need to be regularly bringing those work streams back together to understand where the trade offs were. So if I give a very specific uh, one, so for example, care homes have been mentioned um, several times today uh, and clearly uh, the kind of the outcomes for people who are living in care homes have been awful, both in terms of the number of deaths in that sector, but also they have basically been locked down in their own homes for the entirety of the last 15 months. So from a quality of life perspective, it's been awful as well. But if you look at what was happening last March, there's been a lot of conversation about the discharge from hospitals untested into care homes. And I've been one of the first to criticise that as it, it caused risk um, to care homes. But let's put ourselves in that position last March. Uh, we were seeing pictures of what was happening in Italy with hospitals being overrun. The NHS was being told, do whatever you possibly can to increase surge critical care capacity. The there was no easy choice last March. There wasn't a choice to say, let's just keep these, this person in hospital where they'll be absolutely fine. The choice was, let's keep them in hospital where they are likely to be exposed to the risk of COVID-19 as well. Plus, by them being in hospital, we've got less surge critical care capacity. Or do we move them to a care home? where again, they're at risk of infection. So th th there's no easy decision there. So if you just look at the NHS, you might go the discharge policy was right because it was prioritising surge capacity. If you just look at the care home outcome, you can say that was wrong because of the risk it created for individuals. So what you do need the inquiry to do is, it's the point about hindsight and 2020 vision is to go at the time with the context and the reality of what we were dealing with, what were the right choices? Because at that point, we didn't have all of the testing capacity we might have want. There were prioritisation decisions made about testing. They may well have been the wrong prioritisation decisions, but they were being made. There wasn't full PPE available to all of the social care sector. So the reality there it means that you've got to look at both the NHS response and the social care response together to understand there was no good decision, but what was the least worst decision? And how would you then in future, because again, let's come back to this is all about less learned how do you make sure in the future that you've got a decision making process that allows you to in real time transparently understand those trade-offs whereas actually what happened was they prioritized the NHS and then dealt with the consequences for social care and the people that use it later so it is a really tricky one because you don't want to just say everything is connected and everything has to be done together but you do need to be able to draw the, the kind of the ribbons together at times to really get underneath what was happening with trade-offs. Can I uh, Lawrence? Just follow that up. I, mean, I agree very much with what Sally said, um, but you, you have to look back. I mean, the reason why it was so difficult at the start of, of last year, uh, we weren't prepared. Uh, and the reasons why we weren't prepared go back to decisions about how to run the NHS, decisions about how to run, we run care homes. Uh, also, awkwardly, lessons learned after swine flu, uh, which were the wrong lessons. I mean, just because you're learning lessons doesn't always mean that they're the right ones. And we, we, what we learned in 2009-10 uh, is that the scientists panicked uh, and got to spend lots of money for a pandemic that never came or hit us to the extent it was expected. Or what we learned from 2003 was that SARS would be confined uh, largely to Asia and it probably wouldn't hit us. So we learned the wrong lessons from those. Um, and so part of what you do, it actually goes back to a, a point that Bernard was making earlier about maybe you need something permanent is you need some a way of interrogating your assumptions so just making sure that what you thought was right because what you see in early 2020 is um, a series of propositions left over largely from swine flu and, and the assumption that, that, that what we had to fear was another flu pandemic about large gatherings about schools which turned out to be wrong uh, or, or was soon jettisoned. So it, it's a question of capacity. Why weren't there enough tests? Why weren't there enough PPE? Um, because that shaped the decisions that, that were available in, in February, March. Um, but also, uh, why wasn't the spare capacity in the NHS? Why were we running the NHS the way, the way that it was? These are very big questions, but, but I can't see how you're going to avoid them. Just one final point. Um, I think you need to, there's two separate things going on here. There's one, you need a good evidence base. Um, and the good evidence base, like what actually was going on in care homes, doesn't necessarily need a panel to be sitting all together and listening to people come. Somebody can go away and find that out. We need to know how COVID entered the UK and exactly when and where. 
because that made a difference as to whether certain of the decisions were reasonable or not. If, as many suspected, all came in uh, at half term in February, end of February uh, 2020, um, then, uh, you know, we would be looking to closing borders with Italy and Spain rather, rather than with China. So you need that. But then you need to, to go at the decision making itself. And that's where the question of what was known at the time and what was reasonable at the time uh, come in. What was how was the evidence being collected and how was it being presented to ministers and experts? This final point on SAGE. SAGE was pretty good. Uh, eventually, I mean, it didn't take them that long to start publishing its papers. Um, you, well, what struck me is people were talking about how lack of transparency, but they weren't actually looking at the stuff that was actually well into the public domain. I think it would have been good if they were publishing them as they did it right from the start, uh, because there wasn't any, I mean, it, it was good, hard scientific advice, some of it, some of it right, some of it wrong, but it could have been critiqued as it went along. So I think there, you know, the, the, there's a history there that, 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 that that's quite useful. Um, there's a mass of papers already out there Everything that Sage looked at is there already. There's no. Re this is why I don't see why we're having to wait till next spring to get this started. There's plenty of stuff people could could get the, their teeth into um, before you you start worrying you know, worrying all the civil servants about go gathering their files together. Uh, Bernard, did you want to jump on that? Oh, you're on mute, Bernard. I, I totally agree with all that, uh, and the. And the, the um, and it's, I still think the most important thing is about the preparation. What should we have known? What should we have had in place? And what should we know now and have in place now when the next thing comes? Gus O'Donnell very honestly said, just as we went into the lockdown on World at One, one Friday lunchtime, uh, um, in, with the benefit of hindsight, he had hindsight in March last year, um, I should have advised ministers to spend much more on this, uh, on 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 this, on preparation for this sort of thing. Um, international comparisons have been mentioned; so important. It was very obvious from quite early on that Taiwan, Japan, and Vietnam were having a very different experience, um, and nobody was prepared to ask why. The group think was too strong. There wasn't enough people capable of of generating the data, and there was this. Um, I mean, borders. Remember what happened when. Uh, Donald Trump suspended all aircraft movements from the United States to Europe. Everyone said, oh God, he's gone completely mad, you know, he's complete overreaction. And actually he was right. He was way ahead of the pack. So, OK, what are we meant to be learning from that experience or perhaps not that experience, but the fact that Taiwan, Japan and Vietnam definitely isolated themselves. Um, and I, I just, you know, what we could have known. I remember watching a video uh, on Channel 4 uh, in January about the Wuhan lockdown and my immediate reaction, I, I was gripped. It was a self-made video of a married couple who were filming everything and they were taking people to hospital. They were all in PPE and th at that stage, nobody really knew how serious the virus was or how deadly it was. And I thought this is coming here. And I got on the internet and I bought myself masks, gloves, um, 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 hand gel, and um, the rest of the family thought I'd gone mad. Um, and then I had lunch with um, a, um, a, a major health uh, body and um, I said, this was mid-February, I said there's going to be a global pandemic and there will be a huge stock market crash and a global recession. I didn't affect my behaviour, by the way, I didn't change my behaviour, but intellectually I knew it, in, in, emotionally I hadn't grasped the consequences of it. And I think it's that challenging, I mean, why do women run into, sorry, I shouldn't say women, um, why do people run into their houses to grab things when their house is on fire, when that is the most stupid thing to do. Um, but that was the equivalent of what the government was doing. It was pretending that it could carry on with life as normal. When we knew, intellectually, we already knew this thing was coming and we knew it wasn't a, a flu virus, but we went on carrying pretending it was a flu virus, that it wasn't a coronavirus. Uh, so how did the system correct itself to test and trace stuff? Everyone knew it was blinking chaos for ages. and. Um, uh, I got deep throats telling me what was wrong and I was sending notes into the government saying what was wrong, but nobody did anything about it because it was too politically difficult to, uh, the system didn't work and that's what we've really got to grapple with. I think that's a really interesting, really, really interesting point there and I think that just speaks to this sort of 
wider issue of sort of you know learning the right lessons and uh, and actually embedding them which has been a challenge for inquiries over time and, and I think uh, Bernard what you were saying earlier about the role of select committees and, and how they can hold sort of government accountable for the long-term implementation of recommendations is, is something that I know the Institute we also have argued for for a long time. I'm conscious we've only got a few minutes left and we have so many good questions that I'm afraid we're not going to have time to get to but hopefully we can pick up in later research. What I would like to end is uh, just a simple question from David Vincent um, which to each of the panelists and maybe if you could just give me like 30 seconds on this and, and that's what would you requ uh, regard as success for the inquiry? So uh, maybe if we go to Bernard then Lawrence and then Sally for the last word, um, 30 seconds on what do you think success looks like? Um, that everybody feels that they've been heard, uh, that nobody is being blamed for the mistakes they make. N nobody will have willfully got it wrong, uh, that nobody is making party political capital out of the difficulties. That's a bit of a big ask. And that there is a, a long list of things that we can get on with starting very quickly. And uh, you know, the, the idea of having interim report is so important because there's so much to do uh, to insulate ourselves from uh, another possible pandemic. Thank you. Uh, Lawrence? I must say with, with Chilcot, um, I would have thought we'd, we'd succeed if people said, yeah, that's probably what happened and moved on. Um, and I think that's a quite an important thing. You want people to trust that the, what they've been told has got it more or less right, that the, 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 there isn't a cover up, um, that, that, that has been honestly, candidly dealt with. Um, and then I think that we, out of it, if it's, as, as I think we all seem to agree, it's a different sort of inquiry to those that have gone before, that it's something upon which we can build. So it's it's the start of, of, a, of a learning process because, again, as I'm sure we, we all agree, that this isn't going to be the last pandemic or, you know, event, I mean, it could be bioterrorism or something. There are other things that could happen. And so you, you need to get into the habit of continual learning and interrogation of what you think were the lessons that you've learned before to make sure they're still correct. Thank you very much. Sally, take us home. Thank you. Uh, great to have the last word on this. And David, great mm -hmm. question. Very short question, but very profound question. Um, I think I'd say three success factors from my point of view. The first is timely. Uh, we know a pandemic isn't a one off. We will have other threats to our uh, the health of the population. So timely conclusions, be them interim or final. Um, the second is that it ha it has credibility, so people have buy into its findings and its recommendations, uh, and people feel it, it it was a process which enabled uh, them to contribute, to be heard, uh, their perspectives to be um, sought. So timely, credible, and then the key for me is that there's actionable insights and recommendations that uh, Whitehall can then throw themselves behind making happen. So so something is different. The next time we are better prepared, we better understand how to step up the decision making machinery we need. Uh, so for me, yeah, actual actionable insights will be critical. Thank you. I can't think of anything I would add to that. I think that is a really good synopsis of what a successful inquiry would look like. And, and hopefully that is what we are going to get. I think uh, the message of the day is just to get on with it, get cracking with it. I'd like to thank you again. I'd like to thank all our panellists, uh, Sir Lawrence, Sir Bernard, Sally and Leila. Uh, thank you all of you for joining in and your questions. Um, it's been really great having you. This is something we will be continuing to talk about. Uh, if you're interested in more coronavirus stuff, we have another really interesting event tomorrow on uh, future COVID-19 scenarios. How can the world meet long term threats, uh, which sort of, you know, continuing the theme of thinking forwards and the next risk might be very interesting to many of you. But other than that, have a lovely afternoon. Thank you very much and all the best.